to increase your English fluency, podcasts are brilliant. Loads of you are listening to podcasts to improve your English, but many of you aren't doing it properly and you're really missing a trick. To miss a trick means to fail to take advantage of a good opportunity. Like if it's a really hot day and the ice cream shop starts giving away ice creams for free because their freezer has broken down but you don't see the big sign saying free ice cream and you pay six pounds for an ice cream from the shop next door. In this case, you have missed a trick. So stick with me and I'll show you an easy method to make the most of your English podcast experience. Before we do that, I have a small favor to ask. Currently, only 37% of viewers are subscribed to my channel. I love making educational content for you. And if you enjoy my videos, you can help me by clicking on the subscribe button. Thanks in advance. Listening to podcasts is incredibly convenient as you can easily fit in listening to an episode or two every day while you are commuting, doing general tasks or chores around the house waiting or working out. And if you have found a podcast that you love, then you are also making learning feel fun, which means it is likely to continue as a long-term habit. Thumbs up. I think that's the third thumbs up I've done in this video so far. Let's put the thumb away now. The trouble is it's primarily a passive activity. And effective learning requires both passive and active learning. A passive activity is something you do, but you don't actively get involved with, like watching this YouTube video. However, it's very easy to turn this from a passive to an active activity. You just need to interact with me in some way like this. Pause the video and share in the comments right now your favorite podcast and why you like these podcasts so much. Then read a few more comments and give a heart or a thumb uh, to at least two other comments that you like. Have you done that? Great. This is now an active activity. Active learning requires you to put in some effort. So how can we apply this to podcasts? You do it with my strategy, three points for progression with podcasts. Number one is to listen for sense. Number two, listen for detail. And number three, shadow for flow. In the first step, you should listen passively as you already do to get the gist of the piece. This means to understand the general idea, the context. The second step in this strategy is where the magic starts to happen. We start diving deeper into the text that we are now completely familiar with and we make this experience more impactful. Using the transcripts of the podcast, if they are available, uh, in the case of my podcast, you can see the transcript on screen using my video podcasts, or if you're a PLOS member, you will have the recent podcast transcript emailed to you each month. Most podcasts will have transcripts available in some way. So you use the transcript, listen while reading along and highlight words or phrases that pique your interest. In my video podcast, I give you a helping hand with this step by highlighting some things for you that I think are interesting. Ideally, you'll also write these phrases in your notebook for quick review later on. Now, armed with this list of interesting vocabulary, spend some time learning what these things mean. Figure out how you could use them in the context of your life. Now, once you have an understanding of the vocabulary, revisit the podcast and choose little sections to shadow to help you with pronunciation, intonation, and general flow of speech. Shadowing requires that you say a line being spoken at the same time as the presenter, trying to match their speed, 
pronunciation and intonation. For example, Hello listeners, welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. Let me tell you briefly what you can expect from this episode. Let me tell you briefly what you can expect from this episode. Hello listeners, welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. Let, Let me, me tell, tell you briefly what you, what you can, can expect, expect from, from this episode. episode. Hello listeners, welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. Let, Let me, me tell you briefly what you can expect from this episode. So in this one, I'm talking to a... That's shadowing. So there we've listened for sense, we've listened for detail, and we've shadowed for flow. By this point, you will have a much deeper understanding of the episode. You've made a much bigger impact on your listening and comprehension skills, and you will have increased your vocabulary. So let's do this together in full now using one of my podcast episodes. Yes, I'm going to shout it from the hills. I have a podcast now. No, I don't have a social life. It's all work, work, work. This episode is called Miracle of Metamorphosis. We start with step one. We passively listen through. If you've already listened to this episode and you want to jump forward to step two, then you need to move forward to this point in the video. The English Like a Native podcast is a free listening resource for intermediate and advanced English learners. Bonus episodes and transcripts are available to PLUS members. And English courses can be found on my website, englishlikeanative.co.uk. Hello there! You are listening to the English Like a Native podcast, the podcast that's designed for lovers and learners of English. I'm your host, Anna, and today we are going through the change. <laughs> oh dear, why did I say that? <laughs> that makes it sound like I'm going to talk about the menopause, as this is a common phrase that we use to describe the menopause. What's wrong with Tina? She seems flustered. Oh, I think she's going through the change. <laughs> but no, we are not discussing the hormonal changes of middle-aged women. We are, in fact, talking about the miracle of metamorphosis. Let me say that again. It's a mouthful. Metamorphosis. Have you ever seen a caterpillar turn into a butterfly? It's an incredible thing to witness, and I've been lucky enough to see it in person, albeit not in the wild, but in my home. I didn't even know this was a thing, but my nanny, uh, a nanny is someone who looks after children professionally. We have a nanny for the boys. Well, she recently suggested growing butterflies. Now, there's a company that will provide you with caterpillars and all the equipment that you need to support them to grow and eventually transform into butterflies. So that's what we did. We went online and ordered some caterpillars. Now, before I continue, I would like to address a myth that I believed wrongly for far too long. According to the myth, the word butterfly used to, in fact, be flutterby, which I thought was adorable, as butterflies do, in fact, flutter by as you sit in the garden. Flutter, 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 flutter. But this is not true. Let me repeat, this is not true. The name butterfly may have come from the insect's fondness for the common bush, Buddleia. A buddleia is a bush that is, well, it's beautiful. It has large drooping spikes of densely clustered small purple flowers and butterflies love it. So they could have been known in the past as the buddleia fly, buddleia fly. And over time, that could have corrupted into butterfly but again, I'm not certain, so don't quote me on that, okay? Right, back to my mail order butterflies. I had visions of these big, fat, green caterpillars turning up, probably because of the popular children's book, The Hungry Caterpillar. However, 
What actually arrived was a small plastic cup containing a sticky substance on the bottom, and this was the caterpillar's food, and five very small black caterpillars. The plastic lid of the cup had tiny air holes cut into it to ensure that the caterpillars had some fresh air. At first, they seemed like they were dead because they didn't move which would have been devastating for the children who were very excited to have some creepy crawlies in the house. (laughs) While we're on the subject, I love the name creepy crawlies. This is a childish term used to describe bugs, basically anything that crawls. So spiders, earwigs, flies, anything, butterflies. And when we first moved into our current house, it was full of creepy crawlies because we had lots of bushes and trees and just greenery literally surrounding the house. So all at the front, down the sides, at the back. And, you know, it was just a haven for creepy crawlies. And so they would all come into the house. (laughs) Oh, this is a nice warm place to uh, seek shelter in the colder months. So we put a stop to that and now it's not as bad. But anyway, yes, butterflies, creepy crawlies. Anyway, I I digress. I mustn't keep digressing. I must go back to the main story. These tiny caterpillars appeared dead on arrival, but luckily this activity is normal and it wasn't long before they started to wriggle around. Then... They basically spent the next week eating, spinning silk and growing, growing a huge amount. They grow more than 10 times their original size, which I guess is similar to a human baby growing into an adult. But imagine that happening in just a few weeks. It's no wonder they eat a lot. They've got to do so much growing. So over the course of about seven to ten days, they eat away at this food that's provided and they grow. My caterpillars actually started fighting a little bit. Some of the larger caterpillars seemed a bit tetchy with the smaller caterpillars. I think the larger ones were hoarding the food and weren't so keen to share I did worry about the smaller ones, nervous that they wouldn't have enough energy to transform. But after a week or two, they crawl to the top of the cup and they start hanging from the lid and they curl up their tails. So they make a J shape with their bodies, which is the indication that they are ready to become chrysalids or chrysalides. I'm not quite sure on the pronunciation, probably chrysalids. Basically, they cocoon themselves. They create a cocoon around themselves, like a little shield or changing room in which they can do their big costume change. They're ready to transform into butterflies. So they produce this outer shell. They encase themselves in this shell and they become smaller and harder over time. And they appear dormant. I'm sure there's a lot going on inside, but on the outside, they appear dormant. After three days of them being in this state, you take the lid off the cup. You do this very carefully as they're all attached and then you transfer them into the butterfly house. Now, this is the bit that really stressed me out because you're supposed to remove all the frass Um, Frass is a new word for me. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but frass or frass, it's spelt like grass, but with an F instead of a G at the beginning. And it's basically the term for caterpillar poop, frass. And you have to remove all the silk and all the frass from around each chrysalis so that when they emerge as butterflies, they don't get their wings and their legs stuck, which can make them deformed basically. So I was very carefully trying to remove the silk but what happened was I discovered (laughs) their defense mechanism. If you touch or move the chrysalises in a way that disturbs them 
their defense mechanism kicks in. They basically start shaking violently. And the point of this is that it's supposed to scare off predators. But it made me really nervous. I wasn't scared of them, of course. But the thing that stressed me out was that they need all of their energy to complete their transformation. And the more energy that they wasted trying to scare me off, thinking I was a predator, the less chance they had of making their transformation and surviving to become butterflies. So they would literally be worrying themselves to death, which is a lesson in life. Don't waste your energy worrying about things unnecessarily. Now, I was warned when I was sent the five caterpillars that only around three of them would survive to become butterflies. And that made me feel really sad, really unhappy, because I wanted each one of them to survive. They were my babies now, my responsibility. So it was quite a stressful moment removing all this silk and frass. But I did my very best to remove as many silk strands as I could without disturbing them too much. And when I did disturb them, I tried to hush them and reassure them that they were safe. Now, there was one caterpillar that was really slow to cocoon himself. He was the one that was bullied the most by the other caterpillars. They didn't tend to let him down to where the food was very often. So this caterpillar was very small compared to the other caterpillars. And I thought, oh... This one is probably not going to survive. He's not getting enough food. And he was a day and a half late changing, cocooning himself. So I thought, oh no, he really isn't going to survive. Anyway, he did finally turn into a chrysalid. And then I had a very long and anxious wait for them to all emerge. Just like a man from the movies in the 50s and 60s when the man would wait outside of the room as a woman was giving birth. It's not like that these days, not over here in the UK anyway. The man is usually in with the woman, encouraging her to push and going through every single moment with her. But in the past, the man would wait out anxiously in the corridor, just listening to the puffs and the pants and the screams, not knowing what on earth was going on. And that's how I felt waiting for my butterflies to come out. (laughs) Then one morning, a few days ago, I came downstairs and two of my butterflies had emerged overnight. (gasps) They had popped out overnight, leaving a little shell behind. Not a shell, but an exoskeleton, the skin, basically the, I don't even know what the word would be the leftovers of the cocoon that they were in, they'd shed it, they'd molted that, come out, and they were now beautiful butterflies, and they were flapping their wings, and just like human babies, they release something called meconium, which is like their first poo, basically. In human babies, meconium is black, but in butterflies, it's red, which makes it easy to mistake for blood. (laughs) So it looks a bit messy, It looks like a bloody mess, but it's perfectly normal. And then about two hours after that, their wings are fully formed. They are fully unraveled and they harden. And so they're constantly stretching their wings to try and dry them off. Now, the following morning, I came down and we had three butterflies. So one more had hatched. Woohoo! I was looking at the last two chrysalises and thinking... Mm, are you guys going to come out? I wasn't very hopeful. But after spending an hour in my office, I popped back to the house to get a cup of tea, of course. And there were five butterflies. There were five beautiful butterflies in the butterfly habitat. Hurrah! They had all made it through the transformation stage. I was ecstatic. So my job at this point was to feed them for a few days to help them to gain the strength that they needed because they no longer had the food preparation that they had in the cup. So I had to provide them with nectar and fruit and things like that. So the nectar was basically sugar and water mixed together. And I served that to them on a few rose petals. (laughs) 
the luxury. I placed these rose petals in the bottom of the habitat and I used a little pipette to suck up the water and then I would squeeze little drops of nectar onto the rose petals using this pipette. I would also take a few slices of fruit like apple, pear and banana and score it with a knife so that it pooled little bits of juice, like a puddle basically, and provided them with a pool that they could drink from. Because you can't just put a dish full of like nectar in the bottom because they could fall into it and damage their wings or worse still drown. You don't want that. You certainly don't want a butterfly death on your conscience. That would be terrible. And today I released three of them, which was bittersweet. I had to cut the apron strings, say farewell and watch my babies fly off into the big wide world. I don't think they have a very long life, so I do hope that the time that they have is full of positive experiences. The final two butterflies didn't want to come out of their habitat today. They seemed a little nervous. So I'm going to keep them safe for one more night and give them some more time to grow and strengthen their wings before releasing them tomorrow. (sighs) So yes, I was thrilled to see all five butterflies hatch. And the thing I put their success down to is positive affirmations. Basically, positive talk, positive statements. I told my boys at the beginning that we have to encourage the caterpillars and the butterflies. We have to encourage them by speaking positively to them every day. There have been many studies that show that speaking positively to plants can help them to grow. It is fascinating. The power of positivity or The power as well of negativity should not be underestimated. And so I said to the boys that we have to be as positive as we can and encourage the caterpillars to grow and then to transform and survive. Thus, every day we'd come down and we would speak to the caterpillars. We would tell them good things. We would tell them that we were proud of them and that we loved them and that we wanted them to grow We'd also tell them not to be mean to each other when they were fighting. And then all the time when they were in their cocoons transforming, we continued to talk to them, to tell them that they could do it and that we were looking forward to seeing them, that we were proud of them. And lo and behold, five butterflies emerged. So just consider for a minute what positivity could do for you. It's often the case that my most upbeat and positive students tend to be the ones who are most present within my community, who take part in all the classes and live streams. They complete the tasks in the courses and they're the ones who make the most progress. I know it can be hard when you're trying to learn a new skill, especially if it's really important to you in your life. If you're prioritizing it and you really really desire change it can be hard to stay positive especially if you feel like you're not making progress you start to feel desperate but it's always good to try and rephrase things or reframe things in your mind so rather than thinking I'm not doing a good job I'm not progressing I'm rubbish think I'm turning up I'm trying I'm working on this. Progress is not always easy to quantify. It's not always easy to see progress, especially when you're at an intermediate level or above. Progress in language learning comes incrementally through consistent practice, regular input, regular output. So reading, writing, listening, speaking, comprehension, just constant language in and out. If you're doing the practice, then progress is happening. This is a mountain, not a treadmill. Every step is in fact progressing you further up the mountain. 
and you will not see how far you've come until you've reached a ledge, a moment in time, where you have the chance to look back across the distance that you have covered. At that point, you'll think, wow, I've come such a long way and I didn't even realise until now. So, be kind to yourself. You are a developing butterfly. (laughs) I'm getting quite profound, or rather dramatic here, but indulge me for a moment. You are a developing butterfly, and all of your energy must go into your development. Focus only on the learning, not on the obstacles not on the time that it's taking you to progress or how fast other people are developing. Focus only on you and the work you are doing and be your own cheerleader. Woohoo! You did it. You did your lesson today. You didn't want to do it, but you did it anyway. Celebrate yourself. Okay, let's move away from the dramatic speech and bring it back to butterflies. If you come to the UK, then you should look to see if there are any butterfly houses, sometimes called butterfly farms, that you can visit. These are places where you can experience lots of beautiful butterflies flying all around you. Some will land on you. It's such a treat. By the way, why is it we are calm when a butterfly flutters around in front of us, but we freak out if it's a daddy long legs or a bee? Okay, it's time to wake up and make this activity active. This is step two, to listen for detail. As I always highlight the interesting words and phrases for you, I have the list prepared. You may want to also make a note of each phrase as I introduce it. Now we're going to deep dive into those phrases and as we look at each one, I will also give you an opportunity to practice step three, which is shadowing. Phrase number one, to be lucky enough. And I've been lucky enough to see it in person. To be lucky enough is to have the fortunate opportunity or the privilege of experiencing something that's desirable. So if you do something that's wonderful and you feel like it's a special thing that you've been privileged enough to do, then you might start that sentence with, I was lucky enough to do something so that people know that you're truly grateful for that experience. For example, I was lucky enough to win tickets to the concert and got to meet my favorite musician backstage. Now, prepare to shadow me. You may need to pause or rewind the video a few times. I'll repeat the phrase four times. Listen first, then try to say it with me. I've been lucky enough. I've been lucky enough. I've been lucky enough. I've been lucky enough. Next on the list, don't quote me on that. But again, I'm not certain, so don't quote me on that. This is a disclaimer to indicate that the information being provided may not be entirely accurate or shouldn't be taken as an official statement. So I'm not sure if it's true. Don't quote me on that. For example, I think the movie starts at 7pm, but I'm not quite sure on that, so you should check the cinema's website to be sure. Get ready to shadow me. So don't quote me on that. 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 Next we have to have visions of. I had visions of these big, fat, green caterpillars turning up. This is to experience vivid mental images or dreams of how something will be. It's often related to future events or imaginary scenarios or past events that you had a vision for that didn't occur. Oh, I had visions of this, but then that happened. For example, last night went so well, but I was really nervous. I had visions of knocking over my wine glass and stumbling over my words and making a fool of myself. Luckily, none of that happened. 
Okay, let's get ready to shadow. I had visions of these big, fat, green caterpillars turning up. I had visions of these big, fat, green caterpillars turning up. I had visions of these big, fat, green caterpillars turning up. I had visions of these big, fat, green caterpillars turning up. Number four is, it's no wonder. Well, it's no wonder they eat a lot. This is an expression used to convey that something is not surprising given the circumstances and the information presented. For example, she studied really hard every day, so it's no wonder that she aced the exam and got the highest grade in the class. <gasps> There's the thumb again. Doo -doo -doo. All right, let's shadow. It's no wonder they eat a lot. 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 Number five, over the course of. So over the course of about seven to 10 days. This means throughout a specific period of time. So during the duration of something. For example, over the course of the summer, I plan to visit different countries and immerse myself in various cultures. So over the course of about seven to 10 days. So over the course of about seven to 10 days. So over the course of about seven to 10 days. So over the course of about seven to 10 days. Next we have lo and behold. Lo and behold. And lo and behold, five butterflies emerged. This is an expression used to introduce or draw attention to something surprising or unexpected. For example, I was searching for my missing keys everywhere when lo and behold, I was holding them in my hand the entire time. And lo and behold, five butterflies emerged. 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 Now we're going to move on to nouns. The first one is metamorphosis. 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 This is a biological process of transformation or complete change that you often see in insects and amphibians. For example, the caterpillar undergoes metamorphosis and transforms into a beautiful butterfly. Metamorphosis. 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 Next we have creepy crawlies <laughs> who were very excited to have some creepy crawlies in the house. This is a colloquial term used to describe small crawling creatures, basically bugs. I don't like going into the basement because it's full of creepy crawlies like spiders and centipedes. <laughs> And who were very excited to have some creepy crawlies in the house. And who were very excited to have some creepy crawlies in the house. And who were very excited to have some creepy crawlies in the house. And who were very excited to have some creepy crawlies in the house. Number three, a defense mechanism. I discovered <laughs> their defense mechanism. This is a psychological or physiological strategy that you kind of go into to protect yourself or that an animal might employ to protect itself when it feels like it's being threatened or in danger. Often a defense mechanism just happens naturally without thought. For example, when threatened, a porcupine's defense mechanism is to raise its quills to deter predators. I don't, do they actually shoot their quills? I don't know. Or may, no, I don't know. I don't know why I did the pow pow pow. I discovered their defense mechanism. 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 Anyway, let's move on to predators. And the point of this is that it's supposed to scare off predators. These are animals that hunt 
kill and consume sometimes other animals. For example, lions are apex predators and are known for their hunting prowess on the African savanna. And the point of this is that it's supposed to scare off predators. And the point of this is that it's supposed to scare off predators. And the point of this is that it's supposed to scare off predators. And the point of this is that it's supposed to scare off predators. And the final noun on this list is a daddy long legs. <laughs> but we freak out if it's a daddy long legs or a bee. A daddy long legs is a common name for a, like a harvestman kind of spider. It has very long legs and it flies. It doesn't fly in any particular direction. It just kind of bounces off the walls and just seems to not know how to steer. I don't like them very much. They freak me out. But we freak out if it's a daddy long legs or a bee. But we freak out if it's a daddy long legs or a bee. But we freak out if it's a daddy long legs or a bee. But we freak out if it's a daddy long legs or a bee. Now the verbs I'm going to do really quickly because you probably know some of these. We have to witness. It's an incredible thing to witness. This means to see or observe an event or an incident. It's an incredible thing to witness. 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 Next we have to digress. Anyway, I, I digress. This means to deviate or stray from the main topic. Anyway, I, I digress. Anyway, I, I digress. Anyway, I, I digress. Anyway, I, I digress. Next is to hoard. I think the larger ones were hoarding the food and weren't so keen to share. This means to collect or accumulate a large amount of something like food or something that you're worried will run out so you hoard it. <gasps> it's mine. It's all mine. I think the larger ones were hoarding the food and weren't so keen to share. I think the larger ones were hoarding the food and weren't so keen to share. I think the larger ones were hoarding the food and weren't so keen to share. I think the larger ones were hoarding the food and weren't so keen to share. Next is to wriggle or wriggle around. And it wasn't long before they started to wriggle around. This means to move or twist in a twisting or squirmy way. Ugh. Stop wriggling around. And it wasn't long before they started to wriggle around. And it wasn't long before they started to wriggle around. And it wasn't long before they started to wriggle around. And it wasn't long before they started to wriggle around. Next, we have to hush someone. Hush. I tried to hush them and reassure them that they were safe. This means to quiet or silence someone by making a shh or this gesture. Shh. I tried to hush them and reassure them that they were safe. I tried to hush them and reassure them that they were safe. I tried to hush them and reassure them that they were safe. I tried to hush them and reassure them that they were safe. Next we have to cocoon. Basically they cocoon themselves. This means to envelop or enclose something or someone in a protective covering to make them look like a cocoon. Basically they cocoon themselves. Basically they cocoon themselves. Basically they cocoon themselves. Basically, they cocoon themselves. Next, we had to score. Like apple, pear and banana and score it. This verb can mean many different things, but in this context, it means to press a mark, usually into something hard, although in the podcast I was talking about fruit, but it's to make a mark in something using a pointy 
tool like a knife or a chisel or a screwdriver. If you're a decorator, you might score the paint or the plasterboard or the wood to mark something, the edges or where you're going to make a cut or something like that. You score it. Like apple, pear and banana and 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 score it. Okay, three fun adjectives. Number one is flustered. What's wrong with Tina? She seems flustered. To be flustered is to be agitated, confused or disorientated, often because you're in a hurry or something unexpected has happened. Oh, my phone's ringing. Oh, I've just dropped something. Oh no, I'm late. Someone's shouting me. Oh. What's wrong with Tina? She seems flustered. 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 The next word you may never have heard before and it's the adjective tetchy. Tetchy. Some of the larger caterpillars seemed a bit tetchy. To be tetchy is to be easily irritated or touchy. Sounds similar to tetchy, touchy. You're prone to being in a bad mood for some reason. Some of the larger caterpillars seemed a bit tetchy. Some of the larger caterpillars seemed a bit tetchy. Some of the larger caterpillars seemed a bit tetchy. Some of the larger caterpillars seemed a bit tetchy. Next we have bitter sweet. I released three of them, which was bittersweet. Bittersweet describes a feeling or experience that combines both happiness and sadness, joy and sorrow. For example, I might describe being a parent as being bittersweet. It's wonderful to enjoy the company of your children and watch them grow up, but it's horrible <laughs> watching them grow up and changing and then eventually leaving and not needing you anymore. Bittersweet. I released three of them, which was 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 bittersweet. All right, here are some phrasal verbs, idioms, and general sayings that I thought were quite interesting from the podcast. First, we have the phrasal verb to kick in. Their defense mechanism kicks in. This means to start or take effect, often referring to the beginning of a process, action, or the impact of a substance. Like, I took some painkillers, but they took quite a while to kick in and take away my headache. Their defense mechanism kicks in. 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 Next, we have to cut the apron strings. I had to cut the apron strings, say farewell, and watch my babies. This is a phrase we use to describe becoming independent or self reliant, often when you're breaking away from your parents or your family. Someone has to cut the apron strings, either the child or the parent, and say, you're on your own, go and live your life. I love you, bye-bye. I had to cut the apron strings, say farewell and watch my babies. I had to cut the apron strings, say farewell and watch my babies. I had to cut the apron strings, say farewell and watch my babies. I had to cut the apron strings, say farewell and watch my babies. Next is to put something down to something. And the thing I put their success down to is positive affirmations. This means to attribute or explain something as a result of a particular cause or reason. She thinks her success is because of her hard work. She puts her success down to hard work and perseverance. And the thing I put their success down to is 
positive affirmations. And the thing I put their success down to is positive affirmations. And the thing I put their success down to is positive affirmations. And the thing I put their success down to is positive affirmations. And finally, we'll end this list with a conjunction. And it's a fun word. I love to get it into my lessons. It's the word, albeit, albeit. To see it in person, albeit not in the wild, but in my home. This is a conjunction that means although or even though, and it's used to introduce a contrasting or qualifying statement that acknowledges a different or opposing point, but still allows for the main point to be true. It's often used to express a concession or a limitation. For example, she decided to go on the trip, albeit reluctantly, because she knew it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. To see it in person, albeit not in the wild, but in my home. To see it in person, albeit not in the wild, but in my home. To see it in person, albeit not in the wild, but in my home. To see it in person, albeit not in the wild, but in my home. Wow, you are still here. You are very dedicated and I'm really proud of you. Be sure to write, I completed this lesson and your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed doing this activity with me, then consider becoming a Podcast Plus member. Then you'll be able to access exclusive podcast episodes as well as some deep dives into my regular podcast episodes. I'll put all the details in the description below. Now if you're hanging around and you'd like to listen to some more podcast episodes, here is the playlist for all my video podcasts here on YouTube. Until next time, take care and goodbye!